Well, hello everybody and welcome to the ELN October webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Emma Dixon and Shona Smart from Ecom Scotland who are doing the session today on e-learning project management. So I'll hand over to you ladies now. Welcome everyone and thank you. And just to reiterate Jones, thanks for joining us today. From today, your e-learning projects will run smoothly and easily. And that's a big promise. It does also rely on you taking the top 10 tips that we're going to share today and carrying them into your next project. Developing e-learning, as we know, often involves a trinity of tight deadlines, strict budgets and multiple stakeholders. Good management and good governance, in our experience, are key to delivering the best possible project outcome. And I'd like to walk you through our 10 top tips and help you peek through the blinds a little bit into the vendor perspective of developing an e-learning project. I'm Shona Smart and I'm one of the learning technology consultants at Ecom. And lots of the things today I'll share with you are from my career experience as a project sponsor on the delivery side of, I can't believe it myself, a whopping over 300 e-learning projects. I'm joined by Emma, who is Product Manager for our Software as a Service division. And Emma will introduce you to an online tool which supports project management and content development a little bit later on. We're often asked who are Ecom, because we're a fairly quiet um, company in e-learning. But we are actually Scotland's largest learning technology company with a team of 42 people based in a town called Dunfermline, which for those of you who know your geography is a swim from Edinburgh, a very long swim over the, um, or a very lovely journey over the new Queen's Ferry crossing from Edinburgh. This year we celebrated our 21st birthday and we're on track to deliver over 100 different projects to clients from e-learning content in all its shapes and forms through to enterprise level digital learning and digital assessment projects. Following this, um, Jones kindly agreed to share details of everyone who's interested in having a wee takeaway from the session. So we've got all of our top tips in a document. Um, so there's no need to write all of this down um, unless you feel the need to. I'd love to see you use the chat feature to ask questions. And we've left some time for that at the end of the presentation. If there is anything burning though, please um, let Joan know and she will come back um, and ask, ask us to respond. So let's spend the next half an hour or so with those 10 top tips. The order of these kind of roughly follows a mature project process that we use at Ecom and relates to the development of a kind of typical e-learning course. I'm also going to share some examples of client stories with you um, as we go through just to add some context um, to what we're talking about. So our first top tip is to agree expectations early. And why do we do that? We do that so that we can frame the shape of what we're all working towards. Is it a triangle? Is it a circle? Is it a square? We just don't know. Defining that shape and the who, the what, the why, the where and the when and how of a project can be quite a long process, particularly if this is your first e-learning project, but it is a very crucial process um, to get right at the beginning. Luckily, lots of the people we work with have agreed some of their expectations internally to gain sponsorship to come to us to procure the specialist support they need. And they know something about the technical landscape of their organisation, their learning management system, whether they're delivering it to mobile, what other platforms are, are in the mix. Um, but a clearly defined project helps us all to deliver what's expected at the outset. It also helps us put the tin lid on my least favourite thing. I don't like kitchen sink syndrome, which is my name for scope creep. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. How do we agree expectations and how do we document that? So the key document here for us is a project brief or a PID, whatever you want to call it. Um, be prepared for your vendor to ask lots and lots and lots of open questions at this stage, because the purpose of this process is to drill down to understand what your needs are 
and also to let us develop a brief that's not open to interpretation in the future. So we'll talk about things like the objectives of the course or the piece of content, who the audience are, what, you know, what do they look like, how do they behave, what are their expectations, what languages do we need to work in, um, is it English only or is it English with a view to going forward into many other languages, what technical aspects with regard to browsers and all that sort of stuff that's um, different in, a, in an ever-changing landscape. Is it mobile or not? What's the budget for this? You know, so that we get it right from a commercial perspective, not only to protect ourselves, but to protect our client. Um, and also looking at the scope of any supporting resources to be commissioned. So is there any video? Is there any audio to be recorded? Are there any other um, pieces of graphic that are required to support the content? Our preferred approach is to document all of that and have sign off before we actually start the development process um, and also sign off again when there's any revisions that make an impact on the project. I can give a good example of that. We've been working with RNIB, um, the site loss charity, for around four or five years now and I've made about 20 pieces of content together so there's some co-produced content that RNIB have developed with other partners in the mix as well. The expectation of that at the outset and continuing throughout the project was that blind and partially sighted people would have an equitable experience of e learning with a sighted person. And to get that right, we would leverage all of the accessibility tools that are in Android and Apple operating systems. Um, and that was the overarching brief, um, supplemented with lots of te technical detail on the how, the why, the where, the when. Accountability to that very technical brief, which did change a couple of times during the development, was key because that's what we used at the end of the project to measure the success of the delivery and against those very complicated technical objectives. We wouldn't have done that without our next tip, which is establishing roles and responsibilities. Why do we do that? We do that simply so we all know who's who and what their contribution and accountability is to the project. Most times it's a new project, there are new roles and new skills, and we're all learning new skills all the time as we develop projects with clients. There are new processes, there's new knowledge, and crucially, new expectations of people's contribution. And amongst all that mix tends to be a team of new people working together, not necessarily for the first time, but you know, we've, we've, um, we have a number of clients who've got, we've got long-term relationships with and some who we've got relationships with for just one project. From our perspective, we can have a team of about 14 people involved in an e-learning project. So this is me opening those blinds and letting you peek through a little bit. But normally we have a project sponsor who holds the commercial authority um, and delivery authority over the project. So that tends to be myself or my colleague Colin. We then have a project manager who holds the resourcing authority and that's just who's nominated to take this one on from our team. We have instructional designers who work with the client to define the approach and the detail of the course and how it behaves and what the objectives are and all that sort of stuff before we start with a digital designer developing the actual course. And the final process for us is quality assurance, which is handled at a both tactical and strategic level by our um, quality assurance team. One of the major risks in an e-learning project um, is that an equivalent client side team has not been appointed or that their roles are unclear. And increasingly Colin and I spend time coaching and educating our clients in the necessity for this and the behaviours and expectations of our client side person. How do we do that? We normally tease this out as part of that whole project brief and PID process that I've just spoken about. We identify the people, we identify the role and we document that and it helps all of us communicate with the right people about the right thing at the right time. An example of this is a work, piece of work we did with Shelter just a few weeks ago and um, developing e-learning for their commercial audience. Much earlier this year, um, we were called in to support this project as it had been stalled, uh, started, sorry, and then stalled internally. 
We had clearly defined the expectations and roles and responsibilities in a project document from last time round. And it was actually a simple process for us to use that as a framework again. 80% of the people were the same that we'd worked with previously. And 100% of the technical expectation and audience expectation was the same. The only mild concern we had was scheduling to a two-week delivery timeline, which we wouldn't have done without our next tip, which is documenting the plan. This seems such an obvious thing to do. It's often missed in my experience um, of being, I used to be on the other side of the fence as a commissioning client. Your timeline and resourcing are the when that complements all the what, how and who of the brief. Why do we document a, an actual delivery plan? Because it lets us all manage the risk of planned non-availability right at the start. I don't know how many projects I've had in my lifetime where the stakeholder has said to me, oh, I'm on holiday in two weeks' time. No, I can't, I can't revise that storyboard because I'm away involved in another project. So it lets us manage that and actually have the conversation about that with our client. It also, on the flip side of that, ensures from our perspective that we can confidently take the project on. At the moment, we've got 15 in active development and several in the queue waiting to come on. So it, it really allows us to work well with our resource planning. So planning well and having some contingency baked in as well prevents the project from wandering madly off the timeline of when we've agreed to deliver and it helps our clients with contributing when that contribution is needed. How do we do that as part of that project plan? Um, normally it's a project file or a Microsoft Excel file which has got some dates on it, it's got people identified, resources called out and includes all of the stuff that's on the screen just now, your activities, your schedules, your milestones for everything. Um, and that is communicated to, out to everyone. Hopefully the project will go well and we'll not actually ever have to revise this document. You also don't need to be an MS project expert or have any PRINCE2 qualifications or anything like that. Common sense works just fine for this level of schedule. I'll give you an example of the necessity for that. Um, oft, quite often we're developing suites of content for clients, so many projects running consecutively or running concurrently. A few years ago, we won a project for the NHS to develop e-learning for 18 different topics on quality improvement over 10 months. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, 10 months, 18 projects, but it did lead to lots of concurrent projects with a range of SMEs, all with different availability and different skills to be an SME. Some had done it before, some hadn't, um, and there's quite a bit of capacity building from us um, to support those people through that process. And all of this had to be weaved in, at least initially, to work we'd already committed to. Good resource planning and the occasional pizza at tea time um, helped all of our team deliver that on time and on budget. How we did that was using the right methodology for the right project. So I'm going to talk about one methodology now and I'll introduce another later on in a case study. In the grand scheme of things, um, e-learning projects are actually not overly complicated and they really lend themselves to a predictable approach that's based on solid planning and simply doing the right work in the right order. We can favour something called a waterfall methodology. So if anyone's trying to blind you with project management science, that just basically means you do one thing, then the next thing. Um, as it helps us predict delivery, as being on scope and on budget, and it's generally well understood by our clients. And it lets us program manage with less risk all of the activities that we've got going on across those 15 whatever projects at the same time. How do we choose the methodology? So we have the brief which defines the requirements and that's at the top of the waterfall. We then document a sequence of tasks and processes with all the planned resources connected to our staff availability and all sorts of things simply flows from one to the next. So that's waterfall. That said, sometimes we, need, we have the flexibility to take a needs must approach. Um, and I can share an example of some work we did with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency that's needed a more agile approach. 
Um, there was a delayed procurement on this one, and the procurement decision was taken three weeks before the course needed to be delivered. Um, and the course was around some quite technical and legislative content for a, a, an audience of about 700 investigative officers. On day one, um, an instructional designer, Aileen and I, met nine people at SEPA over a cup of coffee and kind of looked a bit oddly at the many lever arch files that were lying on the desk, thinking, oh my goodness, um, all of that's legislative content and that's all to go into an hour's worth of e-learning. Um, my vendor colleagues who are on this call today will be familiar with this, I'm sure. The law was to be ratified on the 31st of March of that year and we were to deliver the course to live on the 1st of April. There were no jokes in there, there was no April Fool's prank, this was real. On day one as well, we stripped that core team to three key people at Ecom and two from SEPA. We had to position it so that the delivery team at our client could pull in expertise on demand and remove the risk of designing this content by committee. For us, communication was key. We used much more of an agile approach, which is favoured by our software engineering team, simply to cope with the incremental nature of the content development, um, because we weren't, in this case, building a storyboard and signing off a storyboard and going to build the content. It was all happening at the same time. And how we did that was bringing everyone together every single day for those 15 days, um, actually or virtually for an update, where at four o'clock in the afternoon, it was a little bit like making soup. We kind of all dipped into the pot and tasted it as we went along. Um, where we shared the changes, we agreed the content and tasks for the next day as well. For this project, that was the right approach and it worked really well. Um, I wouldn't use it for everything. It's one that you have to pull out when it's required. But the key to making it all work was open communication and trust between us and our client and being able to have some really, what I would call adult conversations um, about the content and how we were approaching it and why. To this day, it's the project that's had the best engagement metrics that I've seen in 20 years in being in learning technology because of the way it was rolled out and how the client actually worked really well on the communication internally as the project was being developed. So it was a little bit risky, but it worked. Talking about risk, let's not all be surprised by risks. When you think about it, an e-learning project is actually two projects. So it's a training project and a software development one too. And sometimes that can expose more risk than developing another format of training intervention. I'd like to take a few minutes just to highlight the top three most common risk areas and how the previous planning tips that we talked about earlier can help avoid or mitigate these. The first major risk for both parties is scope. And I promise to come back to my kitchen sink scenario. So if you can, visualize a team of people standing at the kitchen sink. We're four weeks into a project development. The objectives have gone all blurry. The content has grown because there's another 15 stakeholders have come out of the woodwork and they all want the whole content of their brain dumped into a 40 minute course. A video is now needed. And there's some animations that we didn't consider that someone has thought would be a nice idea to highlight a gnarly new process that actually the client forgot to mention to us. Um, do everyone a favour. This is one that should have a great big avoid written across it. Be diplomatic is my top tip and leverage the power of that well-crafted brief with expectations and timelines documented. The second risk is more of a technical risk. We're in an ever shifting landscape of browsers, devices, and an expectation that if you build this content once, it will work for every user, no matter how exotic their kit is, or in some instances, how prehistoric their kit is. This is a risk to be mitigated. And my advice to you um, as a client is that your IT team are your new best friends because their knowledge of your organization's digital strategy, and yes, there will likely be one, um, and what they're working on in the next 
two, three, five, six months can have an impact on your project. So please do make a relationship with them, talk to them and get them on side to check off the technical bits of the brief. If your project's a bit more public facing, then take ownership of communicating the technical requirements up front to your users. Tell them, you know, it's not going to work on an Opera browser on a Windows 3.1 machine. Just own that piece of communication. The last type of risk I can group together is a kind of people risk, and these vary from project to project. Our plans are counted for expected outages like holidays, and there's some contingency there for short term blips. But what about the unexpected? Not all risks are equal. For example, a long term absence of your single person technical SME might be unlikely but it would have a devastating impact on the project. Most people risks are mitigated by that proactive, open and timely communication. However, you might want to consider simple risk analysis as part of your internal planning to cope with things like the loss of a key person to the project. There's a really easy way to do this and you can all Google it, but there's a four box grid on risk management that wanders, wanders around the world um, where you're describing likelihood and impact. So a high impact and likely to occur in the top left hand box down to a low and impact and unlikely to occur in the bottom kind of right hand box. It's a little bit like planning on the back of a beer mat, but it does work um, with this type of project. I'm going to talk, stop talking now and switch over to Emma for a bit because Emma's going to have a chat around using online tools um, to support your, both your project management and your content development. Thanks Shona. So why use an online tool to help effectively manage your e-learning projects? Well, when creating e-learning, the project management is often a role forgotten. Using an online tool, such as e Author, which we use internally, you can build content having the added intelligence of the project management features. And when you consider the landscape of authoring tools today, in the top 52-ish named by the e-learning industry, project management was only a feature of two tools, which shows that this is often something that's left out. We've got a scenario for you, so we're just going to set the scene. Um, Ecom have been commissioned to develop a cyber security course, and there are stakeholders scattered across the world, with varying levels of digital competence. We've got the content loosely organised, but it needs instructional design input, and we have a 10 week timeline to delivery. So, our cybersecurity course is a prime example of using a tool such as Ena Author to manage project management and also the project from concept to delivery and everything in between. Once our expectations were agreed, it was time to establish the roles and responsibilities. So in the case of the cybersecurity project, that was identifying our authors and our reviewers. Documenting the plan is where ENA author project management features come into their own. You can set your project timelines and tasks to the team. The project manager can watch the dashboard update daily when each task is addressed. Each task also allows notes and can allocate time to measure progress, allowing you to note improvements or lessons learned for future projects. Following the plan, we'll then move into the storyboard feature and design mode, which is a seamless transition and then falls into the client sign off. During the design and storyboarding, notations mean that the communication is active throughout which means we can actively manage a change if this is a requirement during the project, which often is. Our project preview allows us to emulate devices, for example, mobile on the go, again, which would be outlined in the project plan and ensures that we're meeting our deliverables as expected. I'll pass you back to Shona, who's going to talk about how we should be treating it as a partnership. So why should we treat an e-learning project as a partnership? That's easy, an easy question to answer. It is because it is a partnership. Remember a few minutes ago when I described an e-learning development as two projects coming together, a training project and an IT project. It's also two teams of people coming together to share their knowledge. 
Our clients have the knowledge of the training content and the planned impact on their people and their organisation. We have the knowledge of how to translate that into a good, effective piece of learning. How do we share knowledge? It's a fairly organic part of the project development, um, but please don't ever be concerned about asking why or asking how. We do it loads. I, I ask people why all the time, all day, every day. Um, but my key takeaway is to remember that your partner vendor, um, e-learning company, has as much of a vested interest in producing a high quality course as you do, because their reputation our reputation means everything to us as a business. So we want to get it right and we want to make the best job that we can. I can give you another example around that. I talked earlier about our relationship with RNIB and it came, became quite evident quite early on in that project with a new team who hadn't done this before from our client side. They were all trainers and they were quite new to what they called the world of E at that time, like it was, it was some sort of disease. <laughs> Another focus of that work was to gradually share our knowledge in a very planned way, share our knowledge of instructional design, project management, and stakeholder engagement with their team. And this client's a wee bit unusual in that they do their own storyboarding, or they now do their own storyboarding, they didn't do that at the start, but they now organize all of their content and it comes to us in a fairly well-formed state. But over the first few projects, we absolutely worked side by side with their team on different parts of projects. Um, that was actually made easy because their team were based, are based in Glasgow, so about 30 miles away from us. Um, and we had some room in the e-com office, so they based themselves here for quite a little, um, a couple of days a week for about seven or eight weeks, just to absorb and suck in the knowledge um, that was from our team. The sort of key objectives of the first few courses were to develop building blocks. So things like the anatomy of an eye that were going to be needed across quite a few of their courses um, were developed and we built the client's confidence on those small pieces rather than have them dive straight into a big piece of content. We did that through four projects and on project number five, the client was confident about owning that part of the process and we stepped into the kind of sanity checking role um, so that when a, a storyboard came to us we were checking that it was it was valid, it, it was logical, it was flowing well, the language was good um, rather than getting involved in the technical nitty gritty of the content. We also shared all our project documents and processes with our client and they customised them to fit their terminology and timelines and we took back some of their ideas on making those documents much more accessible as well, because quite a lot of the stakeholders that we worked with were either blind or partially sighted. We did a session on the role of a subject matter expert, and we developed that jointly because we had to help engage with some of the technical experts in a consistent way and ensure our client's team were being consistent in their treatment of their SMEs. Our team were also supported to adopt the RNIB test methodology and all the processes and all that technical testing on Android and, and iPhones and things so that we could transition more of that work to us um, as our team built their capacity. And this partnership approach was supported in no small way by tip number eight, which is communicate to keep on track. And this slide absolutely speaks for itself. Good communication internally at ECOM and externally with our client is essential to a well-executed project. As part of the brief, we can identify the often and what format. Um, excuse me a moment, we are having a slight blip. Um, they've still got audio. My apologies, we've disconnected something at this end. I'll start at the beginning of that slide again. This one speaks for itself. Good communication is essential between internally ECOM and with their client to a well-executed project. As part of the brief, we normally identify how often and what format we would like the communications to take. Is that a communication by email once a week? Is it a phone call once every week? What, you know, how would our client prefer to be communicated with? Speaking through those lines again for a moment, Team ECOM have a Monday morning session and we have all of our active projects are updated internally and any actions are agreed and changes are communicated. This helps us keep a really close eye on any drift from the plan and kind of trim our sails and adjust to any course if it's necessary. This really helps us with tip 
number nine, which is actively managing change. When I was thinking about how to describe why you would actively manage change, the best analogy I could come up with was because sticking your head in the sand actually doesn't work. Despite all of our planning, there'll be times when we need to change and manage change sensitively and manage change well. And how do we do that? We take ownership of the changes to the plan and take ownership of communicating the impact of these changes. I can give you an example of that. We've got a current project which is running late. It's jinxed. I don't have another description for it. It's suffering the impact of every people risk imaginable. The loss of a key SME, a new product launch at our client that has their remaining small team of stakeholders. They've only got three staff in their organisation. They're all globetrotting around exhibitions and trade fairs. It meant that we actually put the suspension, a suspension on the project for almost 15 months. It's been back as a live project for a few weeks now, but the storyboard sign off again took two weeks longer than planned. So it's now on off track by another four weeks to delivery. Simply as other project commitments at Ecom meant it lost its original build slot. As an e-learning vendor, sometimes you really rely when things go wrong on the partnership and the relationship of trust that we've built up during the early phases of a project to help explore realistic alternatives and different approaches with your client when we hit something that is actually not in our gift to fix. So, you know, we could have kicked off all we wanted, we could have been really annoyed about that project, but actually accepting the fact that they, our client didn't have the capacity to contribute to it really helped us have those open and honest conversations. My last tip is around reviewing for ongoing improvement. Project reviews are really important because we all learn from the successes and failures of actual lived experience. We also know it's important not to make the same mistakes and break any bad habits, both internally and hopefully also with our clients. We use active project reviews to consider what went well, what didn't go so well, and what should we do differently for the next project. And that's always an iterative conversation. The process leaves us with a little bit of a list of do's and don'ts. And without all of this learning, we'll just simply continue to make the same mistakes. How do we do that review? Openly, round the table, looking people in the eye, honestly, and with integrity. And we have a sort of loose agenda of, did we meet the project expectations? Time, budget, delivery, the expectation of how it looks and feels, the expectation of how it behaves. We always ask about people. How, do, how are our people behaved with regard to this project? Is there anything that you, as a client, would like to highlight back to us? Is there anything that we can help you with um, internally with client review on, you know, perhaps some, someone needs a bit of training or perhaps something's that someone's actually really good at something um, and we want to highlight that. And these also, this conversation also covers project processes and, and timings of communications and how we communicate. How, can, how do we get better in culture of continuous improvement? This doesn't have to be a dry meeting with a formal agenda. Internally at Ecom, we practice what we preach. And when someone develops something new or different, we share that internally in a session we call an Ecom Circle. We tend to hold one every month or two, and everyone in the business can actually say they want to have a circle as it has a leader, and they take that leadership role and have a direct role in facilitation and take away actions. One I remember clearly is a couple of years ago now, one of our digital designers shared the first commercial project he built in our authoring tool, Enet Author the tool that Emma was talking about earlier. And all of our business were in the training room to see it, accessing the content from our phones and making suggestions for the next iteration of the project roadmap. So it doesn't all, we don't always just review projects with our clients, we're also experienced at reviewing internally. Before we take the questions, I'd like to just close by saying that without good project management, our business, our teams and our clients would be exposed to unclear objectives, unrealistic planning, unmanaged risk, poor quality of deliverables, and simply wonky projects that are going over budget and delivered late. 
why would we do that? Why would we expose ourselves to that when we can simply avoid the chaos and have projects run smoothly and easily with the top 10 tips shared with you today? I'm going to stop talking now um, and ask if you have any questions. Um, Emma's driving the keyboard, so if there are any questions, if there's anything that we can help with you um, or help discuss, that would be fabulous to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma and Shona. That was very interesting. And I especially liked your sum up at the end. Because basically, you're going to run all your projects at a loss and increase the stress for everybody working on them, aren't you, if they're not well organised? It just and then it sometimes feels, Joan, that you know, we've been a little bit tough with our clients, but I can assure you it's tough love. Mm. <laughs> and, and sometimes we, we have to have, so have that project conversation really early on. Um, and explain the necessity for good project management. So that's kind of where the sessions come from and where those top 10 tips have come from is that experience. Yeah. And, and it's all very familiar. I mean, I've, I've just been working on a project where um, there were like four different topic areas, four different modules, and each one had a steering group. Yeah. So they were trying to design by committee. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any real experience of, you know, doing e-learning as such mm -hmm. and we also had two subject matter experts who were meant to be writing the content and they didn't have experience of e-learning either um, so it can be really challenging although it, it's I'm sure at the end of it all they'll all be much further on yeah. than they were at the start but it can be quite hard work and it's not always factored into the project scheduling yeah, well, I mean, that capacity, whole capacity building stuff, we've now started actually being very upfront about that, you know, sometimes before a project's commissioned and, you know, when we're chatting to a client about a possible project, uh -huh. then we've started to bring that and introduce all this stuff very much earlier. And, you know, what capacity do you have? How much support do, you, do your staff need to do this? Is it new to them? You know, is it something that is different to their day-to-day -day job? Do they actually have the capacity to do that? you know, from a time perspective and from an experience or skills perspective, so. And I can see how that must reap real benefits when you've got repeat projects with clients. Yes, yeah, so <coughs> you're kind of setting out the, the rules, if you like, of the game um, before you start. And when you've got repeat projects, particularly, I mean, we've got one um, with the, that big one with the NHS that we had, there was something like 60 stakeholders involved in, you know, in some, we're trying to avoid herding cats. Mm -hmm. Um, while we wait to see whether anybody else has questions they want to put into chat, um, you mentioned earlier on that you need to have adult conversations with your clients. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit more about that? Something actually I've been exploring, um, I've been part of the CIPD organisational development group um, in our local Mid-Scotland branch um, for quite some time and I've come across this concept of having a two-way actual conversation where you can kind of come out from behind yourself um, and have that sort of sit down at a table where you're not actually in the role of client and supplier. Mm -hmm. That can be a difficult role when you're trying to educate and, and speak to your customers. So it's about that having that honest conversation um, rather than, you know, some, sometimes clients, and I know this is going to sound a very horrible thing to say, but you're treated as a supplier like you're delivering toilet roll mm. and actually not doing that it's a professional service so it's, it's setting that out at the start of the project and being able to have those you know this isn't going to work because and we can we can give you some evidence for that mm -hmm. um, and sometimes trying to steer your client in a direction that they've maybe decided on a direction as well before you start the project you know, so you get a very clear brief that says they want you know 12 videos in this course then actually videos are maybe not the best medium and having to factor that off in a sensitive way yeah. can sometimes be challenging, you know, if your clients come to you with a very clear expectation of what they want yeah. and your views perhaps different based on the experience of a similar client or a similar, a similar treatment of the subject topic. Fiona's asked a question, is there any reason or consistency in the reason when e-learning e projects don't work? I see um, common common reasons. The common reasons why projects fail are down to poor communication, Fiona. Um, I, the ones that I've seen in the past where we've not had great success, both in my current role and in my past life um, with other organisations, is down to either you're not communicating well with your client or 
your client is not communicating well with you. Um, and I know that sounds like a really, really basic thing to say, but if we, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know uh, from both sides of the relationship. Thank you. Any more questions? I liked what you said about um, the four-way grid uh, for risk assessment, yeah. and John has put a link in the chat about that, so we can oh. all look at that offline. Yeah. But uh, in my experience, I've done quite a lot of health and safety stuff, and in my experience, people will consider the the, the likelihood of something happening, yeah. and then kind of stop there, mm -hmm. and they don't actually think about the impact if it did happen and the severity of that. So, yeah. and again, that brings us back to adult conversations. Mm. actually putting that on the table and talking about it in a, in a constructive way. So is the, the uh, project management tool that Emma showed us, are there other ones that you use or is one net author, eNet author the main one? So we use eNet author for some of our projects where our clients have requested that we build or they've, they've licensed the product and we're perhaps supporting them with that. But it's mainly our clients that use the eNet author project management tool when they're building their own pieces of content. Yes. Um, we use it internally in the business, but we also use resource scheduling tools of all types of variants. We've got quite a big team. Um, so if we're building something from first principles, for example, we're building raw HTML content some of our clients have that preferred approach. Um, we just use our own um, project management tools for that. So. I work as a freelance and for some clients, well, in fact, increasingly, I'm being asked to fill in my time on a project, yeah. on an online scheduler. Now, sometimes, you know, they're planning, they're using an online tool for planning resource allocation. Yeah. And I don't actually join in on that because I'm mm -hmm. freelance mm -hmm. but at other times they want me to log everything into a tracking tool mm -hmm. um, and then you know that's logged against a specific project and then it's easy when I do an invoice it's easy for them to cross check that I'm billing for the right, billing work. For the right work I mean you know author does that very well so it also handles the storyboarding process right. so it handles it from the first point of a project um, through the resource planning if you like the storyboarding process, all of that crucial sign-off on a per-page basis, actually, once something's been built, um, you're not just signing, the client's not just signing off the whole project, they're signing off um, page by page yeah. that everything's acceptable. Um, and at the end, the reporting pushes out all of that data that you would need, John, to just, um, you know, your, your timing. It doesn't push out what's not recorded, um, but you know, if it's recorded, um, it gets pushed out. And there's also a kind of communication system in it as well, so you can go out to the project team and ask questions. And it's worked really well. We've got quite a lot of clients who we do multiple projects for that are in lots of different geographic areas. So one that my colleague Colin had recently was the stakeholder was in London, the key um, project sponsor, but the subject matter experts were in America and in Dubai at the same time and that's a 12 hour or 11 hour time difference mm -hmm. so using the tool to communicate in their different zones actually worked really well because decisions could be made taken and executed and on a rolling cycle of decisions being made taken and executed so. without you all meeting at the same time you mean we didn't uh, we didn't at all have to meet at the same time because it just wasn't going to be logistically feasible for that to happen so again these, these things really lend themselves to that can I ask something about the scale of a project? Because obviously you're working on quite large scale, you know, programs for like for the. Yeah, I mean, we've got a really good milestone, so we've got a lot of program based stuff. We were developing, you know, many pieces of content for the same client with the same or different teams, but we've also got, you know, the little one off projects that we maybe, you know, half an hour of e learning for a quick product support or something like that. So we kind of work across the, the big and the small. But the question I was going to ask was, how important is it to go through all of these issues that you've laid out here when it is really just a very small project? Can you get away with taking shortcuts? No, not? absolutely not, because the short projects tend to be the ones who have the most inexperienced stakeholders at the client side. Um, I would weight the necessity of the project management, the first part of agreeing expectations and agreeing roles and responsibilities, actually have to have a stronger conversation and a stronger um, agreement because some of the smaller projects are the ones that actually drift off because of that lack of experience um, on your client side. Once your, your clients are a bit more educated and a bit more confident, um, 
we, we do, I'm not saying we ever take the brakes off the project management, but all of that stuff's already been done. Mm -hmm. So once you're getting to project number three, number four for the same organisation, you know, the, the ground rules are set and the conversations happen and, and, the, and the, the relationship's there. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ones where you don't necessarily have a relationship, you know, perhaps you've won a tender for something um, and a piece of work has come your way a lot, you know, and you don't really know the organisation. Um, those are the ones that actually need a bit more project management than they do than the others. I think Emma made a very valid point earlier that you know, when the when you're doing a an e-learning course, the eyes are very much on the design, they're very much on the content. The eyes are not always on the project management. And your client sometimes it surprises your client about the, the amount of weight that's put onto project management. So. Well, hopefully we've got kind of good at it in 21 years. <laughs> had a long time to develop this. So. Well, I've just launched the evaluation poll, if people have a couple of seconds just to fin fill that in before they sign out. Um, I'd like to say thanks again for both of you. Uh, we've certainly had some feedback that it was interesting and helpful, good. and that's great. Um, just for everybody's sake, I'll make the recording available. Uh, you'll be able to send me a PDF of your slides? We shall send a PDF of the slides, um, or we can actually just send a PDF that is not of the slides, it's just a single A4, single side document that has all those tips on it, if that would work better. Oh, yeah, well, let's do that then. And then resource. I will share the chat uh, with people if they want. If you don't want your name men mentioned in the chat for whatever reason, then you need to just email me back and let me know and I'll take it out. Um, the recording will go up on my YouTube channel, which sounds very grand, but isn't really. It's just one <laughs> learning network website to be redone. Mm -hmm. And I'm pleased to say that uh, booking is now open for the November webinar, which Neil Lasher uh, is going to do, uh, and it's all about mentoring. And of course, uh, tickets are on sale now for the annual conference. I know you guys can't make that in London on the 7th of November, but uh, it's been great to have you here today. Uh, so, unless there are any other questions, I will then close down the session. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Thank you. Bye, everyone.